of staff, economists, legal counsel, consumer outreach specialists, and administrative law judges. There are various parties to the Article 7 proceeding, which include the staff of the Department of Public Service and other parties that request intervener status and are granted such status. Parties to an Article 7 proceeding have certain rights and responsibilities. In the case, they must comply with the procedural rules that are applicable under the Public Service Commission's rules. They must comply with the directives of the administrative law judges, file motions and legal briefs, and participate in settlement negotiations. The intervener money that is provided is available to municipal and other parties to retain expert witnesses, consultants, and lawyers. The funds must be used to contribute to an informed decision as to the appropriateness of the site and facility, and it must be designed, it's designed, I'm sorry, to facilitate broad public participation. If the Article 7 application is later amended substantially, additional funding. The typical case process for an Article 7 proceeding, there are newspaper notices that are published by the applicant prior to the application filing. In this case, the application, Article 7 application, was filed on January 8, 2018. There may be supplements filed to correct deficiencies, and that was done in this case. On July 24, we are now at the process where the public statement hearings will be held. We are having public statements hearings this evening, and we are having them again tomorrow afternoon in Oswego. And there will be a procedural conference that will be held, and that's happening tomorrow in Oswego. At the procedural conference, those intervener funds, to the extent we have received requests for intervener funds, those will be addressed at that time. So the Article 7, what the required to be done is there will be an identification of alternative routes, and then what happens is, and we'll be setting up a schedule for this probably at the procedural conference, there will be a pre-filed direct testimony, which is filed by PPS staff, Department of Public Service staff, and interveners. There is pre-filed rebuttal testimony that all parties can file. There would then be evidentiary hearings before the administrative law judges. There may be site visits, and then there would be filing of briefs, initial briefs, reply briefs. The administrative law judges would then make a recommended decision to the Public Service Commission. There is then a further round of briefing done where the parties can take exception to certain portions of the recommended decision, or they can put forth their agreement with portions of the recommended decision. And that material and the whole record goes to the Public Service Commission, which is the ultimate decision maker in this case, and they issue a decision on the case whether to grant. I'm getting ahead of myself. Well, they can grant it, they can modify it, or they can reject the filing and not issue a certificate. There is then a portion of the process which allows appeals to the Public Service, and only parties to the Article 7 proceeding may appeal the Public Service Commission decision. In order to grant approval, the Commission is required to make certain findings, the nature of the probable environmental impacts of the facility, and it must ensure that the facility minimizes environmental impacts on agricultural lands, wetlands, parks and rivers, and it must give consideration to alternatives and the costs of those alternatives. The facility has to have a minimum adverse impact on active farming operations. They must determine what is going to be the underground portion and not. It has to conform with the long-range electric plans of the state and conformance with state and local laws and regulations. And overall, the facility must serve the public interest, convenience, and necessity. As I said earlier, the Commission may deny the application if it grants the certificate with appropriate conditions, or it can approve if there's a settlement that's ultimately agreed to, they can approve the settlement. They can also grant the application without 
grant the application as proposed. And that's, that's basically the process. Then afterwards, if you want to review the application, again, it's available on uh, www.dps.ny.gov, uh, article 7.htm. If you have any questions about process, we're happy to take them at this time. Um, if you don't, then we'll proceed to the meeting. Yes, sir. If you're a party to the matter of the Article 10 process for the Duluth project, are you sort of automatically a partner to this too, or do you have to apply separately? You have to apply separately. It's a separate proceeding. It's before a separate um, body. So in the Article 10, you're before the Siting Board. The Article 7, you're before, before the Public Service Commission. Anyone else? Questions? Okay. With that, we'll, we'll turn it over to the company, and they'll provide... <coughs> See if you can see it better. Perfect. Thank you. Where do you want me to do? I'm here with the firm Environmental Design and Research uh, out of the Albany office. Hopefully, everybody can see the graphics up front. Um, any of you may have seen me. I gave a similar presentation on the Article 10 side of things, and we're here to talk about the Article 7 side of things. We'll get into a little bit more of the specifics, not focus so much on the process. As I think the judges covered that pretty well. Uh, again, Greg Liberman with EDR with me tonight is Neil Habig from Apex, uh, uh, from Blue Island Wind. We'll kind of talk through in a similar process to how we covered the public statement hearing for the article <coughs> process. There's a lot to cover. It's a big project. There's 33 miles. We want. I think we can make it into bite-sized pieces. We'll talk through the location. We'll provide some clarity. We have some maps up front that indicate what part of the project is the Article 10 components versus which parts are regulated under Article 7. As it was mentioned earlier, they are distinct, discrete, different processes. Uh, we'll talk about the route. We'll provide a little bit of the specifics as to what's being proposed. And then walk through. There's a copy of the application at the back of the room we can show you in terms of what information was provided to satisfy the Article 7 uh, requirements. And then we'll have some time for a Q&A with respect to the specifics of the project. Uh, as mentioned earlier, application was filed in January. It was deemed complete in July of this year. Uh, and the application consisted of over 10 exhibits with support studies. And we'll actually get to some of those uh, towards the end. But this graphic here kind of puts this into context. And I'm going to use this board here very quickly as well. This is Blue Island. And this is the city of Oswego down below. The transmission line, which is considered the Article 7 component, starts at Bilu Island, at the collection substation on the island, goes southeast around Little Galoo, and then veers south towards the city of Oswego. In total, it's about 33 miles of submarine uh, transmission line. This graphic, which is what we have here in the boards, shows clearly the work on Galoo as part of the energy generation facility it is being regulated under the Article 10 process and the work associated with the transmission line, which is as soon as that, all the power that's generated from the wind turbines is stepped up to 138 kilovolts, it now becomes regulated under Article 7, as you saw earlier in the presentation. So from the high side of the on-island collection substation, where all that power is stepped up to the city of Oswego is what's being regulated and what's been presented in the Article 7 application. This graphic represents a cross-section of what's proposed. Galoo Island is on our left. The city of Oswego is on the right. You can see the lake level up top. And essentially what this graphic is, is indicating is that from the collection substation on Galoo Island, 
and at the POI collection, the POI site in Oswego, to avoid impacts to the shoreline, there'll be what's called a directional drill or a horizontal directional drill, an HDDD bore. And that means essentially that there won't be open cut excavation directly at the shoreline, but rather there'll be a bore machine that will drill it underneath the shoreline to uh, a depth of, I believe it's 65 feet, 75 feet? I think it's about 65 feet. Uh, the Oswego end is uh, shallow, about 20, 25 feet. And once the bore exits, <coughs> it will be direct placed <coughs> and or trenched for the balance of the line, connecting Galoo Island to the port of, to, to, the, to the POI and Oswego. This is just a quick graphic demonstrating what the cable will be. It's a 138 KB line. It'll be, as we mentioned, HDD at the shoreline with direct place as we get into water depths. And the reason why we can do direct placement out in the water depths is because of the depth of the lake. Uh, we, there was an ice scour study done that showed once you hit a certain depth, the ice scour is not anticipated to be a concern. So direct placement um, is an adequate method for for laying the cable. Great, just go back one slide to the, to the cross section. So just to give a little context, that uh, cross section of the cable there, the outside diameter is somewhere around eight inches. Um, it weighs uh, in excess of 50 pounds per foot. Um, there are three um, 400 square millimeter uh, copper conductors within the overall package. I don't know what 400 square millimeters, but maybe an inch in diameter or less for the actual conductor. And the rest of the package is just insulator and uh, there'll be a fiber optic funnel in there. But that's, that's the cable. Um, I think there's a few more pictures of, of installation dust. <coughs> This is a graphic that demonstrates the horizontal directional drill at the island, at the collection substation. So over on the right is the collection substation that's part of the Article 10 project. The collection lines from the turbines will concentrate at this collection substation where the power will be increased in voltage to the 138. It will exit from a bore pit on the island out to a bore pit at 65 feet. And a bore pit is essentially where the, the ends of the horizontal direction will drill. Uh, to, as part of the Article 7 filing, uh, there were engineering plans, uh, inadvertent return plans, and a lot of mechanisms up, spelled out to identify how these processes uh, occur in a manner that avoids environmental impacts. And the big takeaway here is that by doing this, at the collection substation and at the point of interconnection in Oswego, you're avoiding what's called the littoral zone, you're avoiding work within shallow waters, you're avoiding impacts to aquatic vegetation, you're avoiding impacts to shoreline vegetation. Uh, this is a very similar map to what we just saw, except it shows the point of interconnection site, which is located on the right, that's in the city of Oswego, and the bore pit here is on the left, showing how that will make landfall in the city of Oswego. From a construction sequence perspective, the materials for the collection substation, which will be located on Galoo Island, will largely be transported uh, from the port of Oswego because the transformers, some of that machinery, some of that equipment is fairly heavy. Uh, whereas for the point of interconnection substation in the city of Oswego, they'll simply be transported over uh, local roads and county roads. That information has been provided for in the Article 7 application, identifying the capacity of those roads. The point of interconnection substation, and I'll show you some pictures <coughs> of it, is in a previously developed area. In fact, it used to be uh, paper mill. So it's in an industrial zone area, and the roads are not really, uh, roads are adequate to accommodate those local deliveries. Here are some slides demonstrating from the cable laying perspective. It's likely that the, the, the vessels will come in through the St. Lawrence, and it can be docked temporarily out of the port of Oswego. Uh, it's anticipated that they can place up to seven miles a day of line. Therefore, we're not talking a very extended or a prolonged construction sequence. It's actually a, a fairly uh, rapid process. This just quickly summarizes at Galoo. From the collection substation, there's approximately 1,000 feet of horizontal directional drill, whereas at the point of interconnection site, the, it's a little bit shallower. That's a, a 2,000 foot directional drill. And the use of a gravity cell, the gravity cell is a best management practice. 
that's used as part of a directional drill mechanism to allow for containment of any materials if needed. <coughs> Much like with the Article 10, the Article 7 requirements um, have a, an extensive focus on natural resources and environmental uh, concerns. Uh, that is largely spelled out in the application under what's called Exhibit 4, which focuses on environmental considerations. Uh, there was a variety of studies performed for the Article 7 application, um, including looking at wetlands, uh, looking at vegetation, how can these impacts be avoided. Um, and similarly, where this project is being subjected to permitting at the federal level through the Army Corps of Engineers for impacts to wetlands. And just to kind of put this into context, wetlands were identified on the island, here's a map showing you can, this yellow dot here, the pointer, but the yellow dot on the southeast side of the island is where the collection substation is located. It's located in a, in a previously disturbed. Could you point where? Of course. You can't see the yellow no. dot from here. Okay. Can you transition line to that? Okay. The collection substation was <laughs> situated in a disturbed old field away from wetlands and doesn't require clearing of trees. And similarly, at the point of interconnection site in the city of Oswego, as I mentioned earlier, it's a previously developed site. That's a picture of it looking toward the lake, <coughs> and the picture down below is a picture of the shoreline. So you can see the retaining wall, you can see the prior development. Uh, wetlands were delineated there. There were wetlands out there. They were more associated with surface drainage features, almost like swales. However, the, the, the design of the substation has been cited to avoid wetland impacts at the POI site. It also avoids tree cover because we, the site has been picked that's fairly appropriate for this use. So we've been able to avoid many of the impacts at the POI site. Within the lake, this is a picture at looking from the point of interconnection site in Oswego, looking to the west and looking to the east. As I mentioned earlier, the use of the horizontal directional drill at the shorelines allows this area to remain intact, to not have to go in and excavate in the littoral zone or result in adverse impacts to near shore waters. And we see this as a, as a, as a positive of this, of this particular uh, transmission line. In addition, there'll be no effects to aquatic vegetation and the line, the route rather, has been established to avoid areas of significant coastal wildlife. There are areas of significant coastal wildlife mapped by the Department of Environmental Conservation in Oswego, but they're west of this particular cable route. So the siting of this has taken into account a variety of factors. What about shipwrecks? That's, we will talk about that, but I'll, I'll hit it now. A side scan sonar for the entire 300 foot corridor was completed. Two potential shipwrecks were identified. Uh, and the, able to shift the line around it. That study was provided to the State Historic Preservation Office for confirmation. They agreed with our study, and in fact, they have approved the project routing as shown in the Article 7 application. In addition, the well, well, collection substation is situated six miles away uh, and is, is essentially a, a, a similar substation to what we've seen before, and that was studied in both the Article 10 and in the Article 7. And the Article 7 also showed a, a, a specific focus on the point of interconnection substation in the city of Oswego. Uh, I mentioned earlier it's in a previously developed area. It's in fact next to a, uh, an existing cogenerational facility and an existing 115, 115 kilovolt transmission line, which is why the point of interconnect is landed there, because all of that existing infrastructure is readily available. So as a result, by siting this in an area that's previously developed, you can see from a visual impact standpoint, there isn't much of an increase in the overall viewship at the point of interconnection facility. And to the cultural resources point, we were able to actually have the, the State, Historic, State Historic Preservation Office weigh in on, they agreed with the archeological studies that were provided for the terrestrial areas at the POI and the collection association, as well as the aquatic resources. I mentioned the side scan, stone, the side scan sonars that were completed. Um, and they also signed off on the, they also indicated that the POI substation is not anticipated to have an adverse effect on historic resources. Though not as large as the Article 10 list of support studies, the Article 7 list of support studies is still fairly robust. You can see here that these were just in support largely of Exhibit 4. 
you know, everything ranging from a submerged cable risk assessment report to an EMF study to a coastal consistency. Uh, similarly, invasive species, have, there's been an invasive species control plan prepared. And really, what these studies are intended to do is to not only document the current proposal and what the impacts may be, but also outline a range of BMPs that would be rolled into a contract so that a contractor will have to comply with the BMPs that were outlined, whether it's an invasive species control plan or whether it's adhering to a stormwater pollution prevention plan. So that information has all been provided in the application. In parallel with this Article 7 process, uh, an, art an application has been filed with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Now, one thing of note here is the, fi the filing for the Army Corps of Engineers takes into account the Article 10 components as well as the Article 7 components because the Army Corps wants to review them as one project. So that's all been provided to the Army Corps, and that process is underway. In addition, the coastal, a coastal consistency review by the New York State Department of State is being conducted as this is work within coastal waters of the state. Uh, the city of Oswego <coughs> does have a local waterfront revitalization plan. So that information in terms of how this project complies with the Department of State requirements and the city of Oswego requirements <laughs> has been provided in the Article 7 application. And the Department of State is initiating their review uh, under the coastal regulations. And as many of you know, there is an Article 10 process that's, that, that's currently uh, underway. And that concludes. That includes kind of my, the, the, our formal presentation. We certainly, <coughs> certainly have some time for some questions with respect to the specifics of the Article 7. We can ask questions to you about what you just said. Sure. So, of Hi, Greg. I'm Neil. Um, I have some questions about the uh, horizontal directional drill, the boring, yep. at, which I find quite fascinating, especially since you're going to do seven miles a day give or take, you know, the weather mm -hmm. out there, 10 or 12 foot waves, but. So, yeah. I'll provide it, just a quick. So my, qu my question is, um, so you're gonna bore and then directly put the cable right in after the hole, or? So this is, is my, I'm not, I'm not a horizontal drill, directional drill expert, but I can indicate there's kind of a point of clarification. The, the horizontal directional drill component of this project is simply at the two ends, at the Galoo Island end and at the Oswego end. At Galoo Island, I believe there's a 1,000 feet, and at the Oswego end, there's 2,000 feet. In between of those two directional drills, the balance of the cable will be simply direct placed on surface the lake bed, surface laid, and that surface laying capacity is, is about seven miles a day. Okay, interesting. Now, is there going to be any explosives out there where you might have to move anything, any kind at all? Any explosives out there? Are you going to be blowing anything up? Not to my, not, I, don't, no. I don't believe so. You don't believe so, but you no. don't know? No, 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 the, the horizontal directional drill is... Well, uh, I understand that, but is there, is there going to be any... Okay, let's answer the question. The, okay. Your question was, is there, are there any explosives, any blasting proposed for this project? The, the answer question. is no. But could it happen? Uh, if needed. Could it happen? Well, uh, I suppose that... Uh, there are some some marine operations, pipelines might uh, be installed where you would you would blast uh, the, the seabed or the lake bed. But that's not what we're proposing here. Um, oh, so it's not proposed. Okay. Now, I, and I ask that because um, there's a lot of beaches there, and there could be dead fish that could go up on our beaches. A lot of campers. I mean, two years ago we we had high water. We didn't have a beach. People didn't put their boats in. You know, that was a big economical fit for us. <coughs> this summer, however, we did have a nice summer, an old-fashioned summer. There was fishing. But now this next summer, um, and I appreciate the fact you're going to go quite fast, but we just don't want uh, dead fish coming up on our beaches. Um, and I guess the other thing is, is if you're doing, how far out, or how do we know where to drive our boats around what you're doing, because we don't want any accidents out there. And I'm sure these So there'll be a are notice to mariners uh, <coughs> during the operation. Uh, there'll be navigational flags on, on the vessel. Uh, there'll be patrol boats around the vessel to, right. to let people know. Um, cable is paid off uh, and surface laid at almost a knot uh, uh, over the back, so it, it would theoretically be more than seven miles a day. Um, but that installation operations, once you get underway, it'll take 
um, some number of hours to, to land the cable initially and winch it into the uh, horizontal directional bore. But once it's anchored into the, into the um, upland manhole, uh, then the, the ship starts to lay the so cable. So it does have to be anchored in. That would make sense because of the movement. Um, now, this is quite a big construction project. It's, it's big. The, the Article 7? No, well, no, I mean, just this is a big construction project from what you're doing. What are the emergency services? Where are they coming from? Well, again, we're talking about Article 7 now, not Article 10. So it's not the wind turbines and all the project there. We're talking about I know the what installation you're talking of the cable. But that's still a construction project. It's a construction project uh, yeah. for, for vessel operations. It's going to be the, the primary uh, emergency service provider, would be the Coast Guard, if there's, if there's an issue. Uh, but there will be uh, uh, trained uh, trained people on these vessels uh, for emergency but situations. But I'm worried about our, our fishermen out there with their either trolling. You have to understand they're trolling. You've got your pleasure boats. You've got your jet skiers. Or, so I'm just wondering. Does, I mean, the Coast Guard's good, but do you, what about the local municipalities? And do they have you checked to see if they have emergency services underwater? Do you well, know? The, the Coast Guard does, and the Coast Guard is responsible for okay, emergency and service and, and navigational safety. There's not a lot of Coast Guard stations out there. Are they, there used to be a nice one on Blue Island, but that's not there anymore. But yeah, they, they closed yeah. down. Uh, so, okay, one more question for you, Brad. Uh, back on the ice, um, the study of the ice, you said. Can you, could you elaborate on that, please? Sure. There was a study completed to determine whether or not uh, to what extent the ice of the lake freezes over would, would affect a cable placement <coughs> bottom. And that study was used to help define the, the cable route and also identify the depths and of the And who did that study? Which and I, and I study? say this yeah. because there are times that our lake freezes over completely. Mm -hmm. I mean, we had, was it three or four winters ago, John? The, the, the ice was so thick in the harbor, I didn't even know if the fish could breathe. So I'm concerned. <laughs> That, you know, when ice starts to grow, as you know as an engineer, it grows fast. Sure. So, and I know you're in a deeper spot, but I just wonder who did that study. Uh, we had two studies done. One was by the um, ABS Consulting, and another one was called CCOR, a Canadian uh, firm. But they're included uh, as uh, attachments to the um, Article 7 study, or Article 7 application. Thank you for that. Sure. sure. I appreciate it. <coughs> your, <coughs> your study is going to be caused in the lake Uh, there is in the exhibit four of the application, there's a discussion of thermal impacts to primarily to benthic communities. And it, there was not a specific study done for this project. There was a reference to several other studies that have been done at the national level and a wide variety of projects. And the conclusions of many of those studies have shown that the heat will dissipate very quickly and that adverse impacts to localized benthic communities are not. Where, where is the heat going to dissipate to? Into the water. Into the water. Into the water. And, so and we're talking water. about a change in temperature where we've got very temperature sensitive fish, lake trout, salmon, uh, and we're heating the lake water. Um, and the depths that this cable is being proposed and consistent with several other studies that have been prepared, uh, those studies indicate that it, 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 the thermal impacts will dissipate very rapidly and you won't end up with a Given the mass, given the body of water size, there's not an anticipate that the lake that will be anywhere else where they've studied <coughs> you know, the Under, Underwater they've cables studied are, are not uncommon. There's been a, uh, any other specific lakes where you I know believe, where the heat has dissipated. Before. Yep, I believe one of the citations in the Article 7 application is in Lake, is in lake Erie for a very similar project. There's actually a power cable that goes to Stony Island currently. Smaller, smaller capacity. Much smaller, much smaller. Yeah, and we know what happened. So the graphic was simply at an exaggerated scale to fit on the map. Right. But, uh, so but, but essentially, yes, if there are, it, the, the, the cable placement will generally follow the contours of the lake at the bottom. Okay. So there's no digging of any trenches or no, it's not, is it anchored along the way as you go across the lake? No, it's going to be surface laid. There, there are some trenches near uh, in Oswego where the bore exit is in shallower water. 
So it'll be it'll be trenched in from water depth where the bore exit is about 20 feet from water depth down to water depth about 80 feet. That's about one linear mile. So it'll be trenched in that area, and then there's a, a, a spot towards the Galoo Island end that will be trenched in water that's less than uh, than 80 feet. But the rest of the cable will be surface laid on the lake bed. With no anchors or anything. No, it's it's, <coughs> it's more than 50 pounds per foot. And uh, as you get uh, below 80 feet in water depth, you're going to be predominantly in a, in a softer sediment, and the cable over time will tend to self-bury in the, in the softer sediment. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about the shipwrecks? How close to the land is the boat going to be? Fair, uh, far away. The, 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 the side scan going on did a 300-foot radius. So we have the capacity when that gets placed to be well far away from the shipwrecks. Uh, there'll be no adverse impact. There'll be no physical disturbance to the shipwrecks. They'll remain as is. Okay. So if um, so if underwater archaeologists want to go down and examine those ships once the transmission line, they would not be affected by either the heat or the electricity from no. the transmission line. Correct. How many splices are in the cable? I, I believe it's not planned to have any splices. It'll be so it's a one continuous. One continuous. Now, where's the cable offloaded from shore to the fire? Well, it's it's probably going to be <coughs> directly loaded at the cable factory to a to a an installation vessel. Now, by my math, that's eight million pounds. Is that correct? About four thousand tons. I don't know in yeah, pounds. pounds. Yeah. yeah. This is from the examiners, actually. Um, last time somebody proposed to do a project like this, um, they had an overland uh, plan for the transmission line. And based on a lot of local opposition, the DPS basically instructed the applicant to come up with an underwater transmission plan. Okay. The applicant at the time dragged their feet on it. They just really kept not responding to, to the DPS and the request, where's your plan, where's your plan, where's your plan. Ultimately, the plan um, um, just went away for, for lack of progress. Um, but the, the applicant dragged their feet because they realized that an underwater cable away with it was way too expensive. My question is, if these guys finally come to that realization too, <coughs> and at the 11th hour they want to change to some sort of different overland plan, does that reset the Article 7 back to square one? Or tell me what happens in terms of they come to you and say, we, want, we need to do this different because it's too expensive. So in this with the underwater proposal, and that's their, their primary recommendation that they're seeking for approval from the, the Public Service Commission. So if, for example, the Public Service Commission uh, you know, were to approve the existing application or approve it with conditions, and then the applicant later changed their mind and said, that's too expensive, we want to do something different, uh, that would be a completely you know, different Project. So, it, it, well, I, I, it would have the same, you know, it would have a whole different suite of impacts. So, it, you know, it would require further review, certainly, by the Public Service Commission. I just kind of want to be assured that it would be put on some, you know, 11th hour fast track to get it done. That you guys would do your due diligence with the new request as compared to the old. Right. So, as uh, Judge Castell <coughs> mentioned earlier, the Public Service Commission is required to make certain findings. So, if there was a project that was much different in the communities that would be affected and the types of impacts um, that the, a cable would have. There's obviously a much different corridor of, of study that you would be looking at and a much different impact. So it would you know, be considered a, a, a different project. It would have to go through a, a different kind of review before the commission. It wouldn't just, you wouldn't be able just to say, well, that didn't work out so we're We'd like this approved, this certificate to apply. That's what, I, that's what I want to hear. Okay. <laughs> no, it would require additional review. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. John, also it would require a, a different uh, interconnection agreement, which is a, probably a three year process itself. But right now we have a, an interconnection application to interconnect at, uh, down in Oswego. And so if it were somewhere else, you'd, you'd have to refile that from, from the start. That process would be. I just have some thoughts 
that I want to share with the judges, and you, you guys have covered them really pretty, is that you've done it the right way. Ma'am, can I just interrupt you for one second? Because this portion of, oh. the, of the proceeding isn't on the record, so if you want, I mean, we're obviously very happy to hear your thoughts, but if you would like it to be included in the formal record, which will you know, be incorporated for the commission's review, mm -hmm. yeah. I would suggest that maybe you hold off this for a little while until the public statement hearing. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just ask a question? The interconnection, that means, are they the people that are buying the electricity from you? Or is that no, the New York, uh, New York uh, Independent System Operator, New York ISO, regulates uh, generators and transmission providers as far as connecting to the existing utility grid. Okay. So you can't just, you know, bring right. a truck out there and attach. You have so to you need approval to connect to, to yeah. national grids. You have to make an application, you have to go through three phases of studies, and they have to approve it and sign it. Okay. And then, do you have buyers for that electricity, or are you assuming that National Grid will buy? Well, I think that's a little bit outside the scope of Article 7, but, but that the, the interconnection process is completely independent from the, the marketing of the power. And is that a public process? I mean, how do you find out what's happening there? Uh, it's... it's uh, Process. Well, we 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 can sell it uh, the power to um, merchant sales, uh, which is you know a, a real time situation into the market, or we could enter into a bilateral. No, I guess uh, what I'm getting at is how is your you're applying to National Grid to connect yes. to their infrastructure in the studio. Yes. How does the public know they're thinking or what if they say yes or no or what what their thoughts are in terms of They're that? they're the counterparty to the interconnection agreement. Um, mm -hmm. but again that's not to deal with the sale of power. In fact, right. you, I understand. I'm just I'm talking about two different things. Sure. Yeah. 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 So the National Grid is uh is um, uh, directly involved in that agreement. Now some of those agreements for infrastructure protection, uh, security <laughs> are not public agreements. You can get credentials from New York ISO. They're called critical infrastructure um, certification or compliance. And you can go online and look at the studies that talk about the cost associated with the infrastructure to be built and the impacts of, of the interconnection with respect to voltage and, and current stability. So do you have a buyer for your electricity yet? Um, well, again, a lot of power in New York is sold uh, merchant from generator plants. Okay. You can set up a financial transaction transaction with a counterparty. Um, we don't currently have anything like that. We could proceed just selling the market, selling the power into the merchant market. Um, we could also hedge that, you know, with a financial institution or or a commercial industrial customer or a group of those. But someone or some entity would have to say yes. We'll take that. I mean, you can't just dump it in to say, all right, somebody's going to give me some money for this. Or Again, this, I think, is, is, is a little adrift from Article 7, but, right. but uh, the answer is, no, you you have to take the price that's available right. in the merchant market. But, yeah, if you're, if you're a, a qualified genera generator and you have an interconnection agreement you're generating, you will get the, the market price at that time. From who? Uh, <laughs> from... Uh, that's a good question. I think it's the New York system operator is, is runs the settlement. So that is that the state or is that a private corporation? Uh, there, New York ISO is a, um, it's a quasi state. Do you know what it is? Instrumentality of the state. It's quasi state. It's 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 also regulated by FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. I just had a question. You and I talked about this months ago, and there was. You show the county boundaries, but you don't show the town boundary lines where the cable goes through. And there's potentially eight towns in the city of Oswego that that cable may travel sure. through. Yeah. Have you any maps that show the potential location of town boundaries? <coughs> and that has to come back to the taxation side sure. of the issue because the towns have to notify the state of, since this is a special franchise, mm -hmm. being on the land of the state of New York, it's responsibility to notify right. the state of any new special <laughs> franchise. So it's going to be important for them to know X amount of miles or feet of cable that, yeah. that travels through their towns. Yeah. Uh, it's, 
It's an interesting question. Um, the towns have not asserted jurisdiction, and so we have been unable to find maps that show where towns go out. Um, the counties go to the border. In, in most areas, uh, state boundaries end three miles from the shoreline. Uh, the lake extends certainly more than three miles. But in the Great Lakes, the, actual, the, the abutting county boundaries go to the Canadian border. Um, so as you said, yeah, the counties are defined, but the towns within the counties you won't see other than uh, there are maps that show uh, that Houndsfield goes out around Stony and Galoo Island, but you don't see where those maps are. And if you if you were to extend the town boundaries parallel to, to, to the direction that they, they exist on land, they would crisscross and overlap, and there'd be, have to be some adjudication as to, to where that is. So it's, um, the towns may choose to assert jurisdiction or not. Um, they haven't so far. Um, it's an interesting thing. We've talked to the state, and they'll tell you in New York Harbor, for example, where there's a lot of infrastructure, cables and pipelines and such, and even Long Island Sound, that every square foot of the, of the state of New York lands underwater is claimed by an abutting municipality at the town or city level, but that just doesn't exist in, in the Great Lakes. So it's a question to be answered. I've seen some archive maps from the 1800s that show Towns with it. Oh, I'd, 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 I'll talk to you afterwards. I'd love to, to. We haven't been able to find them. And one thing to note, too, with respect to the point of interconnection in the city of Oswego, the city has a local waterfront revitalization plan, and they've identified in their plan a local waterfront revitalization area, which has been presumed to be the extent of their municipal boundary. So the mapping that's been provided is the lake, is, is the, what we've been able to find is available, and would be, in, in that case, it's the town of Houndsville and the city of Oswego as the two municipalities. What is there now? It's it's a uh, it was a decommissioned paper paper plant. It was a, an industrial hammer mill paper plant uh, that uh, one of the buildings. Not a great picture. Yeah. 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 So it's mostly concrete and rubble. Um, manufactured globally, um, a few in Norway, um, a few in Asia, one in Korea, one in Japan. Probably it'll be a European supplier. Um, nobody's currently making that size and voltage cable in the U.S. for underwater. So the cable you're going to be using is brand new and not hasn't been used anyplace else. That's right. <laughs> Which end of the cable started? Well, it's got to get through the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway, so the, the beam limit is 78 feet wide, mm -hmm. um, but it's going to be some hundreds of feet long. I don't know exactly. And that's Four. going to, you're going to be able to bring that ship to the island to mm -hmm. access it. I'm sorry. There's, there, it's like this big elephant in this room. Okay. It's it's this huge cable that's never been done before for 30 turbines on Galoo Island. What else <coughs> is going on? What else is going on? I, I wouldn't say it's never is been Cuomo done before. Is Cuomo adding like 500 more wind turbines along the eastern shore of Lake Ontario? No, it, it, it's, um, it, it's kind of a broad, the answer is kind of a, a broad answer. Your question is the economics and why do they make sense? We, people said that uh, in the previous project that it was uh, economically prohibitive um, to, to do a cable. In fact, um, as we said, you, you've got the horizontal directional bores. If uh, in the previous project they went directly to Henderson, that cable itself is about 10 miles long. So the difference here is it's, it's about 20 miles longer. But those 20 miles are in deeper water go to surface light off the back of a cable ship at better than a knot. It's going to take you two days to do that. 
So you're talking about incrementally two days of ship time, roughly $200,000. That's the installation, the variable installation cost between the alternative previously proposed to go to Henderson and then 42 miles over land versus that. So what's the, what's the you're comparing this 20 miles of surface land with a negligible installation cost to overland transmission. This was 42 miles of overhead transmission through new right of way with all sorts of wetlands and all sorts of impact studies and so forth and objections and so forth. And, and candidly, the, the, that mile of overhead construction over land was very comparable to the cost of the cable itself, uh, the underwater cable itself. So it, it's kind of a wash and our solution is 33 miles. Their solution was 52. So it's a shorter overall. The, the, the point is the incremental cost of that variable deep water cable is, is pretty marginal. I Just think, the cost of the cable. Side. I think the question she was asking is what's the maximum amount of electricity you can send through that cable compared to the amount you're generating on Google Island? Yeah. Well, that's a different question, but you can <laughs> uh, well, in, in other words, how many more trees are going to hook into that cable down the road? Yeah. Um, well, a couple things. The, the size of the island limits the number of turbines you can put on there. The size of the cable is, is limited. We're not going to oversize the cable. Uh, and then the point of interconnection is limited. So that, that 115 kV line in Oswego can take a certain amount of capacity. We're not absolutely at the limit, but we're not you know, at 50%. We're, we're, we're injecting about the right size. And those three things happen to line up. The, the number of megawatts that can be generated on the island with the capacity of the cable uh, at 138 kV and also the point of interconnection. So they're all on the same. This is not a Trojan horse where we're going to, you know, put this cable in and be able to generate 500 megawatts. It's, it's there's maybe 10 or 20 percent margin in, in the cable capacity. Question. Um, you said there's going to be a procedural conference down at Oswego tomorrow. Yeah. I'm going to assume you're going to do the same thing you did with the Article 10 where a few days later you basically put the uh, transcript of that onto the site. Yes, yeah, okay. it, it typically takes about a week okay. to get the transcript on. I do have one more question about the cable. How much uh, slack, what percentage of slack are, if, if this is going to self bury, how much extra cable is this going to account for? Well, it's a I mean, it, it, it matter of, of, of foot or so. I mean, it's not going to bury itself 15 or 20 feet. Um, it's, uh, I, I can tell you that's a, the, the complicated aspect of, of installation. You would think that there's going to be some stress there on the end of the cable. Sure ends, it's a lot of glacial tiller or, or bedrock. Um, it, it, the slack has to be carefully managed. I don't know exactly what percentage. If it's if it's not enough, then of course you get suspensions. You don't want that. If it's too much, you can get kinks in the cable. No problem there. You said your your horizontal boring on Jaluna was out a thousand feet. Um, at the end of that thousand feet, how deep is the water? About sixty-five feet. Okay. That's deep enough to avoid the. Movement of ice, ice really starts getting down to where you mentioned where I think ice scour or something like that. Yeah. That's going to be deep enough to not be affected by that. Well, there's sediment. There's sediment there. It can be. It can be buried in that area. We're, we're looking to target limit, depending upon the area. I mean, some out areas are going to be more susceptible to deeper ice scour than others. But it's an amazing phenomenon. It's not a question of how thick the ice is, mm -hmm. three feet, four feet, or something like this. They, there's video in Lake Erie. A big sheet of ice is blown into some ice that's, that's secured to the land, and it forms these ice ridges. They can go down 30, 40 feet in the water. And then the wind will blow that mass of ice, and that can scrape the bottom. 